but I uh, bar uh, being set for me and uh, Morris asked me how to introduce me and I said just say that I don't know anything about blockchains so I don't know much uh, I know very little about blockchains I learned some in uh, in preparation for this uh, talk and uh, Basically, to think what uh, about distributed computing uh, theory uh, you want to know, you should know, and uh, what uh, what are the you know the context in which uh, you should be aware of. So the title is kind of a takeoff on uh, Lamport's uh, uh, very famous paper, "Time Clocks and the Ordering of Events in a Distributed <coughs> System," but uh, actually the talk will not be about time and not about clocks, and not about timeouts, and not about anything. The talk will be about asynchronous systems, and it will be about agreeing, and about using quorums, uh, in order to uh, order sequence uh, events in a distributed <coughs> system. And I should warn you that uh, most of the things I say are not really correct, although they are morally correct. Uh, so if you want to, uh, don't take something that I say here and implement it, it probably won't work. But it has a big grain of truth to it, and I think it uh, does capture uh, the intellectual ideas that uh, lie at the foundations of uh, the systems that are being built. <coughs> so the question uh, that uh, is behind the, uh, the work that I will uh, talk about today is uh, you have a service, and you want to support it in a very large uh, geographically uh, distributed uh, system. And um, so we have uh, the servers uh, set in various places, and you want to, uh, uh, to replicate, to, to, to use these servers to support some conceptual abstract service. So the first thing I want to talk is to tell you a little bit about what's called state machine replication, or the state machine approach to implementing a distributed server. And this is, uh, as I said, this is <laughs> historical perspective. Uh, so lots of the references will have very uh, old uh, dates on them. And I kept, uh, I made sure to keep the dates so you'll know that things are very old. OK. So the idea of state machine replication is, is the following. We have some service. And a generic way, pretty universal to uh, represent the service, is to capture it as a state machine. OK, so we have states. And we have uh, transitions between the states. And basically, whenever we have an input, which is an operation that is uh, applied or, or uh, 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 um, shown by uh, one of the clients of the service, uh, we may uh, make a transition okay, in response to the input. And we move to a new state. Okay, so that's basic automata uh, theory. So whenever we have a state, get an input, we get to a new state, and there's also an output. And I will <coughs> consider just deterministic uh, state machines, although much of what I'll be speaking about could handle also non-determinism. OK. So basically, uh, we can uh, determine the current state of the service of the state machine if we knew what was the sequence of inputs. That's where determinism helps us. And basically, from knowing the sequence of inputs, we can also know actually what, were, uh, what was the sequence of outputs. Okay, so this gives uh, rise to the approach that uh, implementing a state machine is basically agreeing about the ordering of the inputs. Okay, if we knew what the log is, if we knew what is the sequence of inputs, then we knew what, is, what the state of the machine is and what the outputs that should have been produced. Okay, and the idea basically is that we're going to uh, replicate the state, okay, have several servers. Uh, maintain several copies of the state, and uh, several uh, uh, copies will basically uh, together kind of uh, go through the transitions. Okay, so that's uh, the situation. We have the. <coughs> this is. It's a new one. Uh, okay, so we have. Okay, so we have uh, the clients that are submitting. Uh, inputs to these uh, servers. They are basically together. There are, there's a bunch of servers together that are replicating the server. Okay, and we basically need to uh, make ma make sure we have a, a well-known log of inputs, uh, order in which inputs were uh, performed. 
Okay, so basically what we are doing is we are agreeing on the order, on the sequence of input events, and that, that will allow us to uh, correctly replicate the server and uh, the service that we are trying to do. So far, so <laughs> the uh, difficulty comes because there is a s there is a possibility of failures, and the failures the servers may actually the clients may fail, but most more importantly <coughs> the servers may fail. And we uh, consider two types of uh, two main types of failures. One is crash <coughs> failures. These are benign failures where the server server just stops operating, not responds to inputs, not responds to messages, not responds to anything. And uh, more uh, uh, worse uh, failures, the worst, ki worst kind of failures, uh, Byzantine failures, which are arbitrary, and the faulty components, mostly the servers, uh, can behave in a very uh, malicious way and do the worst they can do, and even uh, actually cooperate with each other to make uh, bad things. I'll concentrate mostly on crash failures, but I'll get to speak about Byzantine failures to towards the end, if time permits. Okay, so there are three ways, uh, three main ways, three uh, classical ways to replicate the server. I want to go through uh, uh, the three of them just to give you a flavor to know where we're operating. Most systems actually behave somewhere in between these uh, systems or, or could be classified by looking at these uh, things. So the first uh, I, uh, one will be uh, primary copy, basically we have one copy that keeps track of what's happening, a leader. <coughs> then we'll s show how to do things through repeated consensus. And finally we'll talk about Paxos, and I think because Paxos arrived at the scene after these two approaches, I think there's a bit, uh, at least somewhat of a misconception of what Paxos actually does and where the difficulty of Paxos is. Okay. So a primary copy is the simplest idea. Basically, we have all these uh, servers, but in fact, one of them is privileged, one of them is a leader, is the king uh, <laughs> in my uh, slides, and it orders all the inputs. Okay? And uh, that's very nice because once, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, once uh, we have some, uh, a, si a single uh, point that orders all the inputs, there's no question what's first, what's second, etc. Okay, every client sends it either to the server closest to it or to the leader itself. And then the, lead, the servers, uh, the replicated server, share the inputs between them and send them uh, to the leader. And the leader determines in which order the inputs have happened. Now everything is nice until the leader fails. Okay, and if the leader fails, we have uh, basically a single point of failure. And that's not good, you know, there's... Everything is forgotten, maybe there's, uh, we are waiting to hear the answers, and the whole system is stuck. So that's not a good thing. Um, usually the uh, next idea that we see from here is rather than have a single uh, <coughs> leader, basically have, uh, uh, have the processes, uh, the servers together, agree with each other on how to proceed, how to order the, um, the uh, inputs that arrive at the system. So this uh, is done using uh, a solution to the consensus problem. And I'm sure you've seen the statement of the problem earlier to today. Uh, but if not, here's the, the slide. Uh, so basically, in the, consensus, the consensus problem is a one-time task. Okay, it's not an ongoing server service. It's not a long-lived uh, 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 situation. It's a one-time task where processes uh, start with some input. Each process starts possibly with a different input, and then they execute some protocol, coordinating, talking with each other, and at the end of the protocol, they must uh, output some value. And we have two uh, requires, uh, requirements, actually we have three, I'll uh, mention, the th think what is the third that I'm not <coughs> stating on the slide. So the first one is uh, validity, uh, sorry, okay, the first one is agreement, that the output is the same uh, for all processes. And the second is validity, that the output is not, uh, you know, taken out of thin air. It, it is the input of one of the processes. And that's good enough for the crash failure situation. Do you recognize <coughs> what is the third condition? No. No. You are not um, the audience. 
was mentioned today. You give them a hint. It was mentioned today. It was mentioned so today. So usually what we keep of these slides is that <laughs> actually the protocol terminates. Okay? So it's easy to solve problems if you don't worry about termination. It's much easier. It's actually not always so easy. But if, if, you, worry, if you don't worry about termination, life is much easier than if you worry about termination. It's an important concept, actually. It's a very important insight about distributed systems. <coughs> that you should think what type of termination property you want. And it's very important when you replicate services. We are working in a very adverse, adverse situation. <coughs> Indeed, the situation is so adverse that if the system is asynchronous, like we were assuming, and we have no bounds on delays, etc., it's actually impossible to solve this problem. To solve the problem in a way that uh, whenever we invoke uh, the protocol, it terminates. Okay? And it's impossible to solve the problem even only one process may fail. Okay? By crashing. So that's the famous FOP uh, result, and as I said, it, uh, I don't want to do the calculation how, <coughs> how many years ago. Okay? And there are workarounds uh, to consensus. Okay? There are workarounds to this impossibility result, one of them being to solve the problem in a randomized way. So basically, we solve consensus, we, solve the we maintain the two properties that I have on the slide, but what we change is the termination condition. Okay, so the termination condition, termination property is no longer we always <coughs> stop, but we stop wi with high probability, or even we stop with probability one. But we still have a uh, very small, small or even zero probability <coughs> of non-terminating. Okay? Uh, another way to work around is to have a property called solo termination or pro obstruction freedom, uh, saying that we stop, but only in very lucky situations. For example, where everybody starts with the same <coughs> value, or uh, when uh, <coughs> just one process runs by itself, and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are the workaround. But still, uh, even these solutions are fairly expensive. Okay, so a uh, second approach to uh, state machine replication would be to do consensus on each input. Okay. And as I warned you at the beginning, deploying this idea is not so trivial, but it's doable. Okay? So basically, we, uh, for each input that we have, we kind of post it. We try to get everyone to agree on our input, and that will, that, that will be the next uh, transition of the replicated server service. <coughs> okay? And if we succeed, that's the next server, uh, next uh, transition. We know what the state is. We know what the output should be, and so on and so forth. There are many issues. There are complexity, efficient, efficiency issues, because consensus is expensive, even with these weaker termination conditions. There, there's the issue of termination by itself. But uh, again, this is still expensive. Next comes uh, Paxos. So basically, that's repeated consensus. We agree on this, each transition. I forgot I had a slide. We agree on each uh, transition. And uh, we pay the price of a consensus to agree on each transition. I don't know if Morris will tell you uh, about that at some point, but there's actually uh, a way, uh, this kind of argument is a way to show that consensus is a universal uh, task. That whatever you can do, you can do with consensus. Because <coughs> this gives you a blueprint of how to implement anything you might want to do by, by many, many, many invocations of consensus. So if you have a solution to consensus, everything goes. Everything is solvable mm, in some sense. Okay? Again, uh, I, I made this uh, warning at the beginning. But quite a bit, and, and, and almost everything reasonable uh, goes. Okay, but if we agree on each transition, then it's expensive. Efficiency is problematic, and because we c and in, in, in the situation we are looking at, of a large uh, geographically distributed uh, asynchronous uh, system uh, with crash failures, there are many opportunities to get stuck because consensus cannot be solved with a sure uh, guarantee of termination. So then comes Paxos. Paxos. Uh, I know there's, uh, there's this confusion or, or the, the, the line between uh, repeated consensus and Paxos is, is often blurred. 
But here's the way I think uh, is nice to think about Paxos. <coughs> okay. So Paxos is actually a leader-based uh, algorithm. It's, it starts in some sense from the primary uh, approach to uh, replication. Uh, so there's a leader which orders all the, or all the inputs, picks the next uh, transition to execute, just as uh, in the primary idea. But as I said, the leader might fail. When the leader fails, what we do is we elect another leader and transition the work of the leader to this other leader. Okay? And picking the next uh, leader is done through ag by agreeing on the next leader. Okay? So we move the throne, we, we move the king to be another uh, process. Now, Detect, there's, there's no way around it. Detecting if a leader, that the leader has failed and electing, surely electing another leader, um, this, uh, so this failure detection, knowing that the leader has failed and electing the other leader uh, must rely on real-time assumptions. Okay, must hide somehow real-time assumptions. This is due to FLP. Okay, at, at somewhere inside, you will hide uh, real-time assumptions. You'll do timeouts, you'll assume messages get in on time, and so on and so forth. And because of FLP, this thing is not guaranteed to terminate unless the system behaves nicely. Okay? And furthermore, it's really hard to do clean handover of the leadership. Okay? So the leadership might... Uh, <coughs> Leave before telling everyone where, it le where, where it's uh, like in the middle of doing stuff. And the new leader will be elected. Okay? So it's not like, I'm done with my job. Let's do a nice uh, list of, I've managed to handle this one, two, three, four, five. <coughs> now you should start uh, handling six, uh, seven, etc. So there's not a nice handover. <coughs> And because of these reasons, uh, it might be, it is possible that uh, uh, two leaders may concurrently try to do the next transition to, to determine what uh, the next transition is. So before telling you how we handle this, uh, uh, these issues, which is really what Paxos is about, okay? The core of Paxos is not about choosing leaders and is not uh, about uh, agreeing who the next leader is. Okay, the core, we assume that this is done, we can encapsulate this, and I'm not actually going to talk about that. Okay? And if we had perfect timing assumptions, detecting that, some, that the leader has failed or choosing the next leader is not a very hard task either. <coughs> okay, so we want to do something that will be fairly good also in systems that are not perfect and so on and so forth, but this is not what Paxos is about and this is what, not what I'm going to, to speak about. Okay? What I'm going to speak about is how to operate in this situation where uh, leaders, are, uh, leaders uh, disappear or leaders show up, another leader show, shows up, and either they may overlap working together or, uh, or the, the one leader departs before the next leader is installed. Is, uh, it takes, takes its place. Okay? Can, yes. Yeah, so, so leader election and uh, consensus are m not the same, but uh, equivalent enough to, uh, for the uh, impossibility results to carry over. I wouldn't say uh, failure detection. To some extent, some kind of failure detection is inherently... Uh, I'm worried these guys here are... are uh, will catch me if I say wrong things, but uh, so it's, it's to some extent uh, failure detection is inherent to consensus. Definitely, if you can do failure detection, you can do consensus, okay? So I, I, I am reserved about saying equivalence because it means uh, uh, more than that. It means the, the, the converse uh, implication. So in one direction, that's clear, okay? So before I, uh, I, uh, I talk about how we do that, I want to do a small detour and talk about quorums. 
So quorum systems are even older than, uh, uh, than that my previous uh, citations. And the quorum system basically is a collection of sets of elements. So we have a universe, and we look, so we look at uh, subsets of this big universe. Okay? And we have the property that each of these sets, each pair of these sets, intersects. Okay? So there's an intersection. And the simplest uh, uh, type of quorums, I'll, as I'll show you, is called the majority quorums. Basically, for example, if we have uh, three uh, elements in the universe, then uh, the set of uh, all the pairs is a quorum system because each uh, pair of pairs must intersect. Okay? And the Cotteri, it's not really important, uh, actually. It's kind of a minimal, uh, a minimal quorum system. Basically, we don't have extra uh, elements in the sets, then we need to pre preserve the intersection property. And this, uh, this specific example is uh, what's called the majority quorums. All the sets with at least, and this is strict uh, at least, uh, strict in quality, uh, at least half of the universe. There are other ways to do quorums. There are actually plenty of ways, and there's uh, lots of uh, nice work on, on building quorums. Uh, one nice one uh, is a grid-based uh, quorum system where we put the uh, elements of the universe, basically our servers or processes, into a grid, a, a matrix. And then uh, uh, each quorum, uh, some quorums are uh, the rows, other quorums are the uh, columns. And we have for sure that each column intersects with each row. And there are, again, three quorums, and there are various other things. And different quorums uh, are uh, differentiated by the load they uh, put on the different uh, uh, nodes, of the different elements in the universe, and so on and so forth. And there's <coughs> plenty of work uh, uh, to do that. And the reason I introduce uh, quorums is because this is the important property. The important property is the intersection of these sets. So there are sets, subsets of our universe, and we know that uh, each pair of subsets <coughs> intersect with each other. So that's the important property. And w however we get this property, that's what we need. We don't need to work with majorities. We don't need to work with grids. I mean, we could work with them. But the important property is the intersection property. So you are like hinting here that the intersection is one or something? Uh, no, just you in... Actually, in the devo and the column together make a quorum. Yes. <coughs> and uh, it can be proved, though I'm not, I'm not sure anyone pro really wrote down the proof, uh, that uh, you need to inter uh, uh, interact, to communicate with the quorum in order to replicate non-trivial services. And I didn't define what non-trivial <coughs> is and so on. So I, I warned you, I'm not doing things in the most precise way. But <coughs> for some definition of non-triviality, and for some definition of need to communicate, uh, it's possible to, uh, to argue that you need to communicate with a quorum in order to replicate a non-trivial service. This is basically an, an extension of the CAP uh, theorem. And um, the CAP theorem, the Consistency Availability Partition Theorem, basically says that you cannot get all these three properties together. You cannot have uh, both uh, consistency, which needs to be defined, availability, which is more or less like our termination property, and partitioning, which is more or less uh, the quorum property, okay, together. Yes? That's the majority quorum. Okay, just a quorum, a quorum system is a set of subsets that has the property that each pair, inter each pair of subsets inter intersects. So in the row and column example, the row plus column is a quorum. Exactly. So, I said. so uh, okay, so the, the CAP theorem, the fairly famous CAP theorem, basically says that uh, uh, if, you w if you want a service where, uh, where you have termination, when I, when I issue an input, eventually it will be applied, and I'll get a response, for a response from the service, then either I cannot order consist everything consistently, or 
the system cannot uh, be partitioned. And partitioning is really, the, in some sense, the converse of having quorums, being able to communicate with quorums. Okay? So again, that's, uh, I, I'm not sure there's a real uh, proof for that. <coughs> Hence, there's not a real uh, sta careful statement of that. But intuitively, uh, that's what it says. So the Cap theorem uh, goes to Brewer, uh, got its name in Brewer's uh, lecture in 99. Uh, there's like a formal proof in uh, 2002, but really the arguments in these proofs go back to uh, early 90s and probably uh, even earlier than that. So this is the three dot, the dot, dot, dot there. The, the, it appears in several papers beforehand. Okay, so... Uh, we want to do some replicate, we, we want to replicate uh, uh, a non-trivial service. Actually, we want to uh, replicate an arbitrary, generic, uh, kind of a universal service. <coughs> okay? And we know that we'll need to communicate with a quorum. My examples, I'll continue with the majority quorums because they're easier t easiest uh, to, uh, to, to draw on, on the slides. Um, but in reality, you could go uh, to any, any quorum system that you may have. Okay, so Ellie, I told you I have a slide with your name on it. So we want to commit a transition. Okay, so that's the uh, key ingredient of, uh, of the Paxos algorithm. And uh, <coughs> basically, uh, again, we have a leader that has some input that it thinks should be the next thing to be committed. Okay, the next transition that an input and the corresponding transition that should be the next one to be committed to, to be ordered on the service, the service that we are implementing. And there's this, uh, uh, this leader, okay? Now, yes. Okay, so that's the context, okay. In the best situation, actually there's one, like the best case where like a normal operation, everything is fine, it's just this one leader. Okay, but we should take into account uh, following uh, two things. I'll have them on the next slide. Uh, that uh, there could be some other leader that just got elected. Okay, or it could be the old leader that we suspected is faulty and we uh, elected somebody else, but it actually didn't really, uh, was r not really faulty because our timing assumptions were not really correct. Okay. Or it could be that we didn't get to elect the new leader, so there's, uh, there's both the situation <coughs> that the old leader is still around, or the old leader and the new leader, or actually several leaders are around. And there's also the situation that the old leader just left the system and didn't hand over the, uh, the, the uh, state of the replicated server cleanly uh, to everyone else, to, to, the new to the elected leader. I guess some places that's the way uh, um, uh, the ruling is transitioned uh, from one leader to another. So again, this, uh, what I'm going to describe is this part of the Paxos algorithm, and I'm, I'm following uh, what's called disk Paxos, <coughs> Gaffney and Lamport, uh, Synod uh, protocol in uh, Paxos speak. And I, I'll try to qu uh, relate what I'm saying to the, the traditional, uh, the, the, the jargon of Paxos. Okay, so as I said, usually there's only a single reader who is trying to commit, uh, to, uh, commit the, the next transition. So that's the normal case, and we want it to work well. Though, I, as I said, I, I will not actually show you the best way to do this. So there's a lot of optimization that can go into this. But we must maintain consistency where, uh, when uh, several processes are executing this protocol, okay? And uh, we also must maintain consistency where, when the leader fails before announcing uh, the outcome and a new leader is chosen. So the leader was in the middle of doing something and, in, and just failed and the new leader uh, was chosen. Okay? Maintaining consistency doesn't mean that we'll s really solve consensus, okay? It's not, we're not really, this is, we're not solving consensus here. And that's, I think, very important thing to notice. There's, as I said, there's a, a somewhat of a mix-up uh, mix about Paxos. Paxos is not about cons consensus. This is not a consensus algorithm. 
This is uh, just an algorithm that makes <coughs> sure that we do not make, uh, make conflicting progress. Okay, we maintain consistency in the sense that it will not happen that two uh, things, uh, conflicting things will happen concurrently. But it might happen that nothing will happen. Okay? Yes, so no, uh, no transition will be committed. The, the full Paxos uh, algorithm has, at has one component that I already mentioned. Basically, the kind of uh, one component made of two, detecting that the leader has failed and, and electing a new leader. Okay, this is this uses time, <coughs> time and timeouts and real real time and clocks and and, and and all these things. But really, once you have all these things, it's not that hard to do it. Okay. It's harder to do it efficiently, uh, etc. But uh, uh, then you have the the Synod protocol that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, and then I'll mention you have the optimizations. And one thing one thing that makes Paxos complicated is that the optimizations are are uh, already cooked into the protocol in in some sense. Okay, so once you strip away the optimizations and factor out Leader election, you are left with uh, the sign of the uh, protocol. Okay. So, <coughs> committing a transition, and that's called more or less a, that's a ballot in Paxos speak, in the jargon of Paxos. So, um, we have the current leader. I'm and I've done something not totally correct pedagogically because now the leaders, these are the possible leaders, okay? And the leader picks some value. That's the value that it wants to, uh, that it thinks should be the next transition, okay? We'll call it V. And then it's going to communicate with a quorum of these, um, these servers. These servers are uh, the acceptors. Okay? <coughs> so it's going to communicate <coughs> with the quorum of the acceptors. Okay? And then it will do some communication with the acceptors. And if successful, it will know that the new ballot has been installed as uh, we have uh, committed a new transition. Now, the other processes, when, when the uh, leader is uh, correct, and uh, like in the normal best case operation, the other processes <coughs> are not doing anything at this point, and they are just listening. And once the leader decides on the next transition and gets agree uh, commits the next uh, transition, they learn what it was, and they continue. They know what's the state. So this is why they are called the learners. And in many s Paxos implementations and variants, some of these uh, functionalities are folded into the same processor, the same uh, node in the system, just to make things even more fun. Okay. Okay. So the the uh, the leader, the uh, a leader. I mean, I say the leader as if there is one, but we should take in uh, keep in mind that there might be someone else uh, thinking uh, like there's the crown prince thinking that it's it's their time to be the leaders, okay? So the leader has this value uh, that it thinks should be the next ballot. In fact, it's not uh, just the ballot. You, we, we, we uniquely number the ballots just to identify them correctly <coughs> and our, uh, the numbers are increasing, okay? And they are unique, uh, for example, by having uh, like the processor ID attached to them in some uh, clever way, okay? What the uh, leaders do, leader does is to send the number of the ballot to all the acceptors, and then it waits to hear from a quorum. Think a majority of the acceptors. Um, at the same time, each acceptor holds uh, the latest ballot it knows about, okay? The, the one with the largest number that it knows about, and it's uh, L 
say it's VI and I, held by the i uh, uh, acceptor. Okay, so the acceptor gets the current ballot from the, uh, from the leader, looks at what it has in its, uh, what its uh, current ballot is, and if the, um, if the, uh, the ballot it receives is larger than the ballot it holds, then it says, oh great, and it acknowledges to the leader that uh, what you have is a new transition and go ahead. Okay. And if it's, not, uh, um, if it's not larger, then it sends its current, the, what it holds uh, locally, to the, uh, the, le the leader, or a leader, that is uh, talking with it. Okay. If the leader, so the leader collects uh, uh, responses from all the, uh, from a quorum of the acceptors, okay, say a majority of the acceptors, and if none of them tells him that there's a bigger ballot, then it knows that this is the value that, uh, that, that this, is, this is the current ballot and it's going to continue with the current ballot. And if it's not, if one of them returns a larger ballot, then it says, well, there's a, new, uh, a newer uh, value in the system and I'm going to uh, go on with this uh, value, okay, with this ballot. And that's actually the first phase. It's not the whole algorithm, that's the first phase. So this first phase basically allows the leader to know what's the largest ballot in the system, whether it is what it has, was already holding and uh, started with, or there's some newer value uh, floating in the system held by one of the acceptors. Okay, and this will essentially pass on and will uh, do the handover the f uh, from uh, the leaders, the departing leaders. Okay? Now once we have this uh, uh, ballot that we are, the, now, now that the leader has this ballot, uh, it's going to go through to the second phase, and the second phase basically has the same pattern, okay? So all the algorithms we'll see today have the same pattern. We say s send something to everyone, we wait to get uh, back a response from uh, a quorum, usually think a majority, and then we make some decision, change the values, what we do, and usually then send another thing, and wait, and so on and so forth. That's the typical uh, communication pattern. And we'll see in a minute why it's useful. So again, I, I, I've either, I, I'm either going on with the ballot I started the first phase with, or I go on with the, val with the maximal uh, thing, which is larger than what I had, and, I s I, and this is the ballot I'm going to install. Okay, and then I send this uh, ballot, and I wait to hear from a quorum, again, think a majority, and either I get back an acknowledgement, basically this is the maximal numbered ballot, or the current uh, maximal ball ballot. So it's the same pattern. The acceptors are actually doing the same, almost the same thing. Now, if there is no bigger ballot, so if again this was the, uh, the biggest ballot, then I know that the transition is committed and the, uh, this protocol was successful. And if not, I just restart and go on. Just to get a flavor of why it works and how the quorum property uh, comes into play, think that we have uh, another leader in the system, okay? Because the old one is not really <coughs> failed, or because I'm the old one and the new one is already uh, around making up uh, stuff, okay? And we have the property that in order to make, uh, to know that the transition has been committed, each of us has, has gotten responses from a quorum, <coughs> okay? Which means that at least because of the quorum property, at least one uh, acceptor communicated with both of us, okay? So the quorums must intersect. And uh, at least one acceptor has responded both to the, the one leader and to the second leader, the contender, okay? And this one will order, will tell one of them, the other is around and ha it has its ballots. Okay, so that's not uh, a real proof, but that's the property we're relying on. So this is, gives us the consistency, the fact that we will not uh, uh, commit to two transi transitions at the same time, simultaneously. Okay, so that's the way, that's the rough way we commit a transition 
uh, in the Synod protocol. And as I mentioned before, first of all, this must work with a leader, uh, a failure detection and the leader election module. And on top of these two things, well, usually they are sometimes uh, mashed up together. And uh, there's uh, tons of optimization, uh, especially for the normal mode of operation. So for example, one thing that we do is that the leader does not do all this uh, back and forth just for one transition, okay? but it batches. Uh, several transitions together, several ballots together, and try to install them at the same time, okay, with the same uh, communication, okay? And again, when, the, uh, when there's a single, read, uh, single leader and everything is fine and, uh, and nice, that's enough and it works uh, uh, correctly, okay? And, and there are other uh, optimizations that you could do. Okay, so that's uh, one way to do uh, to order events is to, as I said, is, to, is the state machine approach where we <coughs> think of the service as a state machine, we uh, uh, um, capture it and describe it uh, in a generic universal way as a state machine and we replicate the state machine, again the most uh, successful uh, mo uh, widely deployed uh, approach is based on this um, this uh, Paxos approach. But actually, uh, many systems and many services that we have should not or need not be uh, 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 captured by a state machine. Okay, so not all services need the, uh, the strong power of consensus. Some services are weaker than consensus. And basically, Taking the state machine approach is, you know, in some, for some services, the, it's an over-specification. It's much stronger than what we need for the actual service that we have, okay? Which means that because of FLP, essentially, we are not going to deliver what we promised. So we are over-specifying, we are promising a very strong service, but we are actually not delivering what we promised because of termination issues. Another thing we can do is, I call it underspecify, but actually meaning uh, be more precise in the type of service that we want to deliver, to provide, and then actually provide everything we promised. Okay, so promise less, but deliver everything you promised. Let me make it more uh, precise. <coughs> so there are some services that are weaker than consensus. And they can be quite, uh, uh, quite rich, uh, have uh, rich semantics and rich behavior and be sufficient for many uh, situations. In particular, they are weaker than consensus. They cannot be used to solve consensus, but they are still meaningful and helpful in many things that we might want to do. <coughs> uh, simple things are um, simulating a read-write variable, uh, doing a snapshot, doing a counter, which will be the example I will continue <coughs> with. And um, <coughs> so this is going to several uh, papers. I'm going to do a counter and um, as an example, and then I'll show you a bit uh, in more generality what kind of uh, services you might have. Okay. And all these things can be done without consensus. And in particular, we're not going to have this uh, uh, loose ends, like maybe sometimes it doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't terminate, maybe sometimes we depend on timing properties. The, 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 the thing will be totally uh, asynchronous and terminating. Okay, so the example I'm going to use is a counter that has increment plus, not just plus one, add some, uh, some amount and read the value of the counter. So you can uh, write a sequential specification, what a counter means, like the last read returns the sum of all the increments that appeared before it, and so on and so forth. <coughs> okay. Now, the natural way we think of a counter is the single, um, single sum of holding the, value, the current value of the counter. Okay? Replicating this representation of a counter is 
probably amounts to, uh, I don't know what it means to replicate this representation, but if we keep just a single uh, sum somewhere and try to have this uh, concretely, <coughs> we are not going to be able to uh, replicate it in an asynchronous system with failures. Instead, what we do is we rep represent the counter as a vector, uh, uh, like an n component vector, uh, which has in each component the contribution of each process to the counter. Okay? So if I do an increment, I increase my, uh, my uh, component. And I describe this as a, as a vector, but I actually can represent this as a, as a set of pairs, like a process uh, value uh, 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 set. Okay? So, but it's easier to think about it as, uh, as a vector. Okay, so it's easier when I know the number of processes in the system, but I can make it actually also more dynamic and work in a system where the number of processes is unknown in advance, is not known in advance. Okay, so each entry in the vector is the contribution of the process in the corresponding comp uh, uh, index uh, to, the to, to the counter. And in order to know what the value of the counter is, we read this vector, we identify the vector, and we sum the components. Okay, so that's the representation of the counter as a vector of values. <coughs> so we go back to the setup that we had before. Okay, so we have these uh, uh, servers that replicate the service. Each client has in mind the current value of the counter. Okay, what it think <coughs> is, uh, thinks is the current value of the counter. <coughs> so these are the clients. And in fact, also the, uh, each client holds the current value, what it thinks is the current value of the counter. Now what the process does in order to increment the counter, it uh, adds, so if I want to increment by, uh, if I want to increment by A, let's say I'm um, the second one, if I want to increment by A, I add A to my component, <coughs> And send it to all the other to all the servers. Okay, and um, the servers they get the values, and the server accepts the vector if and only if it's coordinate wise larger than its vector. So I get the server gets a vector. Okay, it looks at the vector, and if this vector is comparable and larger than its current vector. It says to the uh, client that sent this message, I accept it. I accept your vector. And it sends an ACK. And if it's not, sorry, and if, if you got uh, accept from a quorum of the server, you know that you're, uh, you've installed your increment in some sense, and you can return the sum of, the, uh, of these uh, components. That's the value of the counter. <coughs> And we have the property that, that's actually the same slide again. We have the property that uh, if we, are, we have two processes, two clients doing at the same, an increment at the same time concurrently, then necessarily if both of them uh, decide that their increment was successful, I mean basically they cannot concurrently decide that their increment was successful because their quorums must intersect and one of the uh, the process, uh, the server in the intersection will tell them one of you is missing the other. Okay, so the values that the, the vectors that get accepted are comparable as uh, component-wise uh, vectors. Okay, <coughs> so because two quorums, um, because quorums intersect, uh, two chosen vectors are accepted by at least one server, one common server. And which means that the vectors are comparable, and which means that we have a um, uh, monotonically increasing counter. Okay? Okay, so the sums are monotonically increasing, and uh, the counter behaves, behaves correctly. Okay, what happens if I don't get accepts uh, from, uh, basically, what happens if a server gets my vector and it's not uh, larger, it's not compar uh, compon component wise? Uh, uh, coordinate-wise uh, uh, larger, then uh, basically you say, I don't accept your vector, and this is what I have now. Okay? 
So you see there's uh, something very uh, familiar, very similar mm -hmm. to what, uh, <coughs> what is happening at the Synod uh, protocol that I've shown you before. <coughs> so you get back uh, this information. Um, and basically, if you didn't get uh, acceptance by a quorum of servers, you update your current uh, vector with what you got from the servers, like a maximum uh, component-wise, coordinate-wise maximum. You update your current uh, vector, and then you add again your uh, input. And, and uh, <coughs> the problem is how you make sure you, that your increment is eventually, or how you argue that your increment is eventually installed everywhere. And it, uh, it's easier if things quiet out, but uh, otherwise you'll have to be picked up by someone else. And I will not go into these details, I think. Okay. And then you repeat. If you are not successful, you repeat, and you forget about your earlier, earlier attempts uh, I I when the responses come. Yeah. So we cannot do this purely asynchronously, right? We have to assume... No, no? you can do it uh, purely asynchronously. Two consensus? No, mm -hmm. no. No, you don't need to solve consensus. This is basically a simpli very simplified variant of uh, generalized, what's called generalized lattice agreement. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing is that uh, in this way, so there's a component that I didn't show you, is <coughs> that uh, your, your, the increment that you want to do is being publicized. And eventually, somebody picks up that you have this increment that you want to do, and they'll, implement, uh, they'll uh, introduce it into the system for you. Can I okay. consensus for two processors with the counter? Uh, no, because you, no. <laughs> Plus, you don't have two processes. Well, you have here. Yeah. But this is, um, <coughs> because the thing is, this is not a, a, a fetch and increment. OK? It's not a fetch and increment. Oh, yeah, you just OK, I just increment. Okay. I can also read, but it's a separate read. A separate OK? So. Here's a, uh, let me explain what was, what transpired here. So again, I, I, as I said, it's in, in, it, in distributed systems, and I actually has a sense that something of similar is true for blockchains from my, my little reading that I managed to do in the last uh, month or two. It's very important, it's, it's very tempting to say, oh, I'll have state machine. Because state machine is generic, is general, is, solves everything. But it's a big canon. And getting it with correct termination, okay, with full termination properties, is, is, is not doable and expensive. And really often what you need is not the full flavor, is not the full power of a replicated, uh, a replicated, uh, a full uh, server, okay, a full uh, state machine. Okay? And you need to be careful what exactly that you are promising or what exactly that you need to deliver. And what we asked, so uh, Giuliano asked me, uh, can't I solve consensus with this kind of counter? So there is a counter with which you can solve consensus, at least for two processes. But this counter does what's called a fetch and increment. It reads what was before, exactly before, and returns you the new value after you added, uh, uh, you added uh, your sum, OK, your, your increment, your, your extra. Uh, uh, Value, whatever. OK, so that's stronger. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you something weaker than that. OK? Yeah. And really, very much a similar idea, and maybe even a simpler, is uh, to do um, with really a, similar, a very similar idea, do uh, <coughs> what's called an, a monoton, uh, uh, insert only set. So I. There's a set, and I only add things into the set. I can implement such a thing with very much the similar, a similar idea. Why? Because I have my inserts in my component, OK? And when I want to insert something, I add it to my component. And I send around these vectors, and whenever somebody gets, uh, somehow agrees, gets the right uh, vector, they just uh, union, take the union of the components, and that's the value of the set. <coughs> In fact, uh, one way to get a, like a more extensive uh, version of it is to, to look at what's called commutative uh, 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 data types, so commutative re replicated data types. 
basically, uh, these are uh, data types where the, the current state depends only on the set of operations, the set of operations applied to the data type. Okay? It does not depend on the order they were applied. And in order to have a concurrent implementation, the sets have to be inclusive. Okay? So comparable. Ordered by containment. Okay? So if I manage to have to uh, implement sets that are a set that are ordered by containment, which I kind of argue that I can, okay, then I can implement any uh, uh, commutative uh, data type, <coughs> so which has the properties that the uh, operation, this describes just a single operation, but again, uh, that uh, the operations are commutative, uh, they are associative, although I think parts of it, uh, uh, part of associativity can get can be gotten read with, and uh, idempotent, so if I have the same operation twice, it doesn't matter. Uh, so with these uh, things, we can do fairly uh, uh, sophisticated uh, data types. Um, so did you teach them linearizability? Uh, no. No, okay. You w will you teach them linearizability or atomicity tomorrow? Okay, so basically if, we, uh, basically if we have this <coughs> property that the, uh, the state of the service, of, of the data type, is totally determined by the set of operations that were applied, and it doesn't matter in which order, which is the situation where we have commutative uh, operations, then if each, uh, 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 whenever I do invoke something, I get back a s the set of operations, Okay, including my own operation. Okay, then I can basically order all the all the uh, things that happened in the system by the inclusion order. Okay, so I have a uh, kind of a sequential explanation of what happened in the system. And if Morris will tell you about linearizability or atomicity, I think you will be able to give uh, a more uh, more precise, more formal. Uh, explanation uh, in, in to meaning to uh, what I said now, okay? And, okay, you have to be formal for this to be done correctly. What I want to say is that uh, it seems uh, like a very strong, this seems like strong, Ken. You're saying, are you saying that if, if only, uh, like, you add stuff, mm -hmm. then you could uh, agree somehow without a Exactly, without agreement. On, on uh, what is the order they were exactly because they have some uh, basically you order, uh, because the order is unimportant actually okay so the only thing that's important is the set of things that happened so you could okay but I have this set arbitrarily that a exactly b. yes but you know I, I need to know that whatever you saw is a subset of what I saw or vice versa, because either you happened before me or I happened af uh, before you. This way we can order our uh, 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 responses, basically. And it seems like a strong assumption, but, uh, okay, so I already shown you, uh, basically, t uh, shown you one and kind of hand waved that there's an, uh, one like a counter and hand waved that you can do a set with a similar way. Okay, you can also have what uh, they call the two-phase set. So basically, if you have uh, sets in which uh, items are inserted and deleted, but if something was deleted, you never reinsert it. Okay, so basically you can represent this by two sets. One is monotonically increasing, and the other is essentially monotonically. So you have the set of elements inserted, and then you have the set of elements d deleted. And by maintaining these two sets together, you can have uh, a larger set. And you can throw in, uh, sorry, <coughs> you can throw in um, also some kind of uh, time stamping, which I will not talk at this point, and have, um, uh, have some time stamp insertions and deletions, and get uh, things like last right reins element set, and observe removed set and various uh, variants. So you start with something rather simplistic, which is easy to implement, but there are variants and, and uh, various flavors of it that allow you to do fairly sophisticated uh, data types 
that are useful uh, uh, for many situations. So again, this is not universal. You cannot just take a state machine, crank it, and get something. Okay? You need to, be, to think, what is it that you are implementing exactly? And what is it that you really need in your system? And if you can get away with something that is uh, commutative, in, in the sense that I had in the previous slide, then you can implement it without thinking about consensus, without relying on timing and timeouts at all. Um, Mal, how's, how's your energies? Uh, we can do another five minutes. Okay. So I will have just a very quick uh, discussion of Byzantine quorums, to just to say that um, <coughs> With the right definition of, of uh, <coughs> with the right extension to the notion of a quorum, you can do many of the things we've done before, also in the presence of Byzantine failures. Um, so I think uh, the earliest definition as such of a Byzantine quorum system goes to Malkin and Reiter. And basically, uh, again, you have collection uh, subsets of the universe, set, set of subsets. And we have the property that each uh, pair of subsets intersect, but now we need it to intersect at a correct process, okay, a non-Byzantine process. And uh, in some t situations, in fact, we want to have further properties. For example, we want to have uh, a subset, a quorum, that is, uh, has only correct processes. And uh, we may want to have a property that in each quorum, in each subset, a majority of the processes is correct. Okay. And uh, you, can, you can get these properties in various ways. And again, you can decouple the properties from the way you achieve them. Okay. So in many algorithms, uh, what you see is we do these things, for example, with, with some kind of threshold uh, <coughs> properties, like extended majorities. Okay. But in fact, we have some underlying principles uh, of the quorum of the pro of the uh, of the quorums that we need, and they can be decoupled from the specific way in which we get these properties uh, at the at the uh, for the quorum system. So, uh, a, sim a simplistic uh, a simplistic uh, way is uh, an appropriate uh, majority quorum, but this is not a simple majority, but uh, all sets that have n plus f over two processes. Okay, so if we have four processes, it's uh, each one, uh, each subset of size three. And they satisfy the previous properties, and and there are other ways to do this. And for example, you might actually use uh, various algorithms to determine who who, do, who belongs to the quorum. Okay. didn't say I need. I say sometimes you want also this property. Okay? In some algorithms, you it, it's help. It's, and you could see why it's helpful. Okay? I'm not saying it's necessary. I'm sure it's not necessary, actually. Um, so for example, you can have a, um, um, so, I, so far I've described quorums as a, as a static way, like something that was predetermined. But in many algorithms, the quorum, the quorum system, like who's in the quorum, who's a qu what's a quorum, is determined in a more dynamic way. For example, systems where the actual number of processes changes over time. Okay, then the notion of a majority is not fixed because you, you don't have like a known uh, n. Okay, and it's uh, you know it's it's it get it can get tricky. Okay, and in some uh, Byzantine algorithms, you need to. Uh, like, uh, like demonstrate you are fine in order to get into a quorum. So there are various ways, but if you, again, decouple the quorum properties you are, you are guaranteeing and the way these properties are uh, used, then I think it's much easier to understand the algorithms. And again, sometimes in order to get the full uh, efficiency and sometimes <coughs> even the full uh, tuning of uh, the, the fine tuning of the algorithm, you do uh, mesh everything together in order to exploit everything you can get. But I think it's useful to take a step back and say, okay, this is one thing that's, uh, that's happening, this is the other thing that's happening, this is why each of them works, and now let's see how they were uh, put together in order to do uh, stuff correctly. 
and uh, basically uh, BFT, Byzantine Fault Tolerant, uh, Tolerance, uh, which I, I gave credit to Castro and Liskov. So, you know, I could spend like hours and hours, and maybe because it's a historical perspective, I should have spent hours and hours and uh, finding the right uh, paper to give credit to, but I, I didn't. Okay, and I gave what I think is the nicest place or like a, a key uh, point in time to see uh, an idea emerge, uh, emerging. And uh, Byzantine fault tolerance in many ways is uh, a Paxis algorithm over Byzantine quorums rather than over simple uh, quorums. And of course, as I said, you have to be careful actually when you do this. And then they optimized a lot of things using authentication. Uh, cryptography. But I think this is uh, my last slide. So um, I guess uh, this is like what's ahead of us and ahead of us or already part of it is behind of us so probably I should have put this like in the middle here. Part of it is already behind us. Uh, these ideas can be applied in new contexts, in, in new combinations uh, in order to uh, build uh, large-scale uh, distributed systems. So I guess that's my last uh, slide, and I'll take questions. <laughs>